This video was made possible through the support of my patrons. After the epic scale of the historical story Marco Polo, you'd think the Doctor Who creative and production team would want to take it a bit easy, that they'd do something a bit smaller scale and manageable for the next adventure following the Doctor, Susan, Ian and Barbara throughout time and space. Well, obviously not, because we found ourselves with The Keys of Marinus, a six-part serial that essentially has a new setting, new supporting cast, and new threat to overcome every week, as our TARDIS team are tasked with travelling all across space to assemble the titular Keys of Marinus. But how did we end up here? Well, basically, after the runaway success of the Daleks, writer Terry Nation was not due to write another story for the show for several more months, a serial tentatively titled The Red Fort. However, new writer Malcolm Hulk, his script Doctor Who and the Hidden Planet, was struggling to get off the ground, and Nation was brought in ahead of schedule to put together a six-parter under a massive time crunch. He was assisted by story editor David Whittaker, who decided to format the serial as a collection of mini-adventures and damn the consequences for production designer Raymond Cusick and new director John Gorey. But let me back up. So our team land on the planet Marinus, on an island made of glass surrounded by an acid sea. Inside a massive pyramid, they find Arbitan, played by George Coluris, who is defending a room-sized computer named the Conscience of Marinus, which upholds order on the planet and conditions its population to repel evil thoughts and desires. But a species called the Vord, led by Yartek, managed to fight the conditioning and they want to take possession of the computer for their own evil enemies. To safeguard it, Arbiton has scattered keys to unlock the computer across space, and he holds the Doctor's TARDIS behind a force field, promising to release it if he and his companions go and retrieve the keys. The Doctor, Susan, Ian, and Barbara are each given a travel dial, which is programmed to take the wearer to where the keys are hiding, and thus starts another epic adventure, where they have to find the keys and save Marinus from the Vord. Over the next month, the group find themselves in a luxurious ancient city, an overgrown sentient jungle, a harsh snowy landscape, a futuristic city, before coming back to Marinus to face down Yartek. And you know what? In a production sense, John Gorry and Raymond Cusick pulled it off. Obviously, it's not like a blockbuster on your TV or anything, but if you look at a story like this one, and then also the Daleks or an unearthly child, the ball hasn't been dropped comparatively speaking. We get some lovely and charming model work throughout the story. only a model. And you've got the alien and vast pyramid of Marinus with the acid lake, which gives the Keys of Marinus a really strong and atmospheric start. And with Susan losing a shoe in an acid tidal pool, it immediately puts our heroes on guard. However, the main overarching threat that bookends this story is the Vord. And they're a bit underwhelming. Their costumes are striking, but they do so little and are so ineffectual as a collective that it's hard to take them seriously. Especially when Ian pushes one down a hole and he just turns into a cardboard cutout. Uh. Oh. But we'll return to the Vord later. Our main player in part one is Arbitan, who is this old, desperate survivor and the last line of defense for the conscience of Marinus. Arbiton has sent friends and family to retrieve the keys, but they've not returned, leaving him alone. I love George Coloris in this role. He's only in this episode of the serial, but it is a pivotal role, and he really sells the idea of this guy spending God knows how long on his own, isolated in this pyramid surrounded by an acid lake and defense mechanisms. And he's lost his friends and family to fates unknown. They just popped away with their travel dials and never came back. That must surely enact a heavy mental toll and it shows. Last year, I sent my daughter. She has not come back. All I have now to comfort me is the distant echo of her voice, the imagined sound of her footsteps. But 
Now your coming has brought new hope. The TARDIS team take pity on him, but they don't believe they can help for some reason, so Arbitan puts a force field around the TARDIS in order to force their hand. He briefs the group of where the keys are, how the travel dials work, and they get sent on their way, only for a Vord to sneak up behind him when he's been left alone and stab him in the back. Badly. Due to the episodic nature of the serial, I'll basically go through it in chronological order, and we'll deal with broader topics towards the end or as we come about them. So the cliffhanger for part 1 has Ian, Susan and the Doctor arrive at the first location, but Barbara is missing, and her travel dial is on the floor, covered in blood. Great start, cool cliffhanger. But in part 2, entitled The Velvet Web, the trio find a luxurious city and Barbara is inside with a whole new wardrobe and an intimate knowledge of how everything works here. Oh, and the blood on the travel dial? She just had a slight cut on her hand, apparently. Now, how on earth was Barbara so far ahead of them? In the span of two minutes, she's had a change of clothes and has settled into the city called Morphaton. Now, if you've not seen this serial, you're probably thinking that maybe these travel dials can also move the user in time as well. So maybe Barbara was transported five or ten minutes or even longer before the rest of the team. But they don't, as Arbiton specifically draws attention to their lack of time travel capabilities in part one. Except that this will enable you to cross space, not time. What? This little thing? Oh, don't be ridiculous, my boy. This is a perfectly acceptable method of travel. Very compact and very neat, sir, if I may say. <laughs> this cliffhanger is a massive cheat. This isn't what happened last week. Have you all got amnesia? But to be fair, the episode The Velvet Web is a really effective, almost Twilight Zone style horror. You see, Morphaton initially seems beautiful and glamorous with very welcoming hosts who offer the TARDIS team fine food and drink, beautiful clothes, and even a well-stocked laboratory for the Doctor. The group go to sleep, only for one of the citizens to place small devices on the heads of each of them. But Barbara's falls off, so when she wakes up, she can see the city for what it really is. It's a filthy place. The juice that they've been drinking is stagnant water. The dress that Susan asked for are just rags, and even the laboratory the doctor requested is just an empty room. Doctor, hmm? isn't that a cyclotron? Huh? Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it's a simple toy. I'm sure they will abuse you. Mm. Ah, now, this might be helpful. Yes, if I can have instruments like these, I might be able to overcome the fault in the time mechanism aboard the ship. And I love the way director John Gorey presents this, and I would love to read the camera scripts for this episode to know what was pre-filmed and what was recorded as live, because the perspective shifts through the camera lens. We get Barbara point of view shots, showing the city for what it really is, but these third person shots of the group show the illusion that has been cast upon them. It's a really chilling way to put the audience in Barbara's shoes, and it's quite unnerving. Look around you. Can't you see? I don't think she's properly awake. Susan, get me a glass of that fruit juice, will you? Yes. Yeah. Here, drink this. No, it's filthy. Now you've broken it. Barbara, what's got into you? Why can't you see? This is going to test our host's patience, you know. It's one of a set. But it's just really a dirty old mug. It's also in this city where Barbara discovers Sabatha, played by Catherine Schofield, who not only has a key of merriness around her neck, but we also discover that she is Arbiton's daughter. But she's been brainwashed by whatever is messing with everyone's perceptions, which is revealed to be a bunch of brains in jars. It's disgusting. Ian, can't you see how you're being used? We are the masters of this place. Only I have the brains to rule my life. The brains order a brainwashed Ian to kill Barbara, which is all kinds of messed up. This scene is genuinely scary. Kill her. Ian. Kill her. Ian. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her.
but Barbara breaks free and starts smashing everything in the room, killing the creatures and releasing their chokehold over Morphaton. As the population start revolting, another slave, Altos, played by Robin Phillips and also sent by Arbiton, joins the group and they set off on their next mission. Now, Here's where things get a bit more complicated, but I think it's for the best. Part of me loves the epic gauntlet being set at the end of part two, where the group decide to split up, divide and conquer, as they try and find these keys, with the group deciding to meet up in five days time. It makes it feel like a grand adventure, though I'm not really sure why they have to split up since there's not really a deadline or a ticking clock, formally speaking. They do have the time to stick together as a stronger unit and get the keys one at a time. I mean, presumably the group separating is why they did not return to Arbitan in the first place because they were more vulnerable, but William Hartnell had a holiday booked, so he's not in parts three and four, which is why the group split up. Well, aren't I coming? No, I, I think it better if you travel with the main party, child. But I want to go with you. Yes, yes, I know, Susan, but don't you see it's better if we split our forces? You see, it's a very dangerous situation, and the sooner we get on with it, the better. For my part, I know you'll be well looked after. That's for me, well, I'm going to a well-ordered society, and I think it's the best and speediest way, really. But like I said, I do appreciate this because there's a real strategic nature to the adventures. In part three, The Screaming Jungle, Barbara gets taken inside a temple by a Hansi statue and the group theorize that as long as Barbara isn't injured, she can use her travel dial to escape and go to the next destination. Do they move on and hope to meet her there or mount a rescue operation where there might not be anyone to rescue? It's really thoughtful. But anyway, this episode focuses on the group in a sentient over grown jungle. The group think that they found a key, so Altos and Susan go to the next location, only for Sabatha to realise too late that the key that they've been given is a fake. Sabatha follows Altos and Susan, leaving Ian to rescue Barbara, with the two getting caught in a series of booby traps and meeting an old scientist, played by Edmund Warwick, who's behind the foliage on the planet. He's strangled by his own creations, but leaves behind a cryptic clue to Ian and Barbara, who are able to find the actual key piece just as the forest is about to break inside his workshop. Honestly, this is probably the weakest excursion in the Keys of Marinus, as it is just to run around in a forest, as Raymond Cusick tries his best to make five square meters of set look like an entire jungle planet. And the episode is just Ian and Barbara getting caught in trap after trap, it's quite repetitive. The next episode, The Snows of Terror, is a big improvement, with Ian and Barbara about to freeze to death on an ice world before being rescued by a trapper named Vaser, played by Francis DeWolf, who gives them food and shelter in exchange for the travel dials. However, he's not who he seems, as he tricks Ian into going out to rescue Altos while unwittingly carrying a bag of raw meat so the wolves will be able to find him. And when Vesa is left alone with Barbara, his real colours start to show. Well, what about Altos? The young man who... He forced me to go up the mountain to look for these girls. Instead, we found you. And when we brought you back here, he wanted to go out again. I don't believe you. You stole those things. Oh, did I? Well, they might have given you the wrist bracelets. But the keys and the chain, Sabitha would never have parted with them. Yes, I thought they were valuable. What have you done with them? You didn't kill them. <laughs> you don't kill anybody in this country. The cold and the wolves do that. He's genuinely intimidating and scary but that does end up working against the episode later on. See, Susan and Sabatha are sheltering in nearby ice caves. Vesa knows where they are, but refuses to go because he believes that there are demons and monsters inside the cave. But somehow, Ian manages to intimidate Vesa into showing them the way. Lead on, Vesa. No, 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 we must There are demons in there. I uh, won't go on. I am not asking you. I'm telling you. Uh, now move. Uh, now, the fact that Vesa has managed to survive in this climate proves that he's strong, there's no doubt there. I also don't think that there's much doubt that if given the opportunity, he could break Ian in two over his knee. But somehow, this school teacher from 1960s London is able to force Vesa into doing what he wants? How can we take this guy seriously? In fact, I think even the story knows that this is not believable, so it has to happen off screen. We get this scene of Ian saying that they're going to force him into it. We want him unharmed. He's going to show us where the cave is. 
Then we cut to Susan and Sabatha in the cave, and then... How much further? It's just beyond the next ridge. How? How did he do it? Anyway, they reach the cave, find Susan and Sabatha and the next key in a block of ice guarded by frozen soldiers. They also find a valve which, when turned, starts warming up the cave. Vesa drops the rope bridge, which is their only way out, but the group manage to escape by building a makeshift bridge as they escape from the now awakened soldiers. Ian even drops a boulder in the cave to obstruct them. They return to Vesa's hut, key in hand, and they get back their travel dials, which they didn't bring with them. Strange decision, considering Ian was able to force Vesa to show them the way to the cave, but didn't convince him to also hand over the dials. Anyway, Vesa is killed by one of the soldiers, and the group pop away in just the nick of time to the city of Millennius, where Ian immediately finds the next key in a glass display, but he's knocked out from behind by an unknown assailant. The key is stolen, and a mace is put in Ian's unconscious hand. In part 5, Sentence of Death, and... Honestly, look at these titles. The Sea of Death, The Snows of Terror, Sentence of Death. Terry Nation is trying really hard to give these titles stakes, isn't he? Anyway, Ian has been framed for the murder of Eprin, another person who Arbiton sent to retrieve the key. On Millennius, you're guilty until proven innocent, and the evidence is stacked against Ian. So who is going to serve as Ian's defense attorney? In a moment, I've got to go in there and face an accusation of murder. I need a man to defend me. I am that man. My lords, I cannot defend a man when I have not considered every aspect of the case. I must have time to examine witnesses, read statements, and to prepare my case. I object most strongly. The demand is reasonable in itself. The crime of murder in Millennius is in itself unusual. The Doctor is back after William Hartnell took a two-week holiday, and my god did he get some good rest during that time, because he comes back in part five of The Keys of Marinus with some real vigour and energy. Now, I'm not saying he lacked it before, but he's off the chain fun and charismatic as Ian's defence lawyer in this case, even going as far as to stage a full-blown crime scene reenactment with Barbara and Susan. There's a weapon beside the body. Do you examine it? Yes. Yes, I think I would. Good. Then you look up in front of you, and you see exactly what you came here for. The micro key. Unbeknown to you, the third man comes out of hiding, creeps up behind you, and you are struck what? down so. Now, he can take what he came here for. And look at Susan. She's so proud of her grandfather. Has she been asking questions about me? Not as many as my grandfather will ask when he calls you as witness. We've got a murder mystery here, with the Doctor trying to save Ian from execution. He tricks guard Aidan, played by Martin Court, into confessing his guilt at the trial. But Aidan is shot dead in the courtroom by an unseen assailant. The plot thickens! And then Barbara gets a phone call from Susan, who is revealed to be held hostage. We discover that it's Kala behind all of this, Aidan's wife, as she planned to sell the piece of the key, which is a pretty anticlimactic motive. Part of me thinks it was more of a rude for her to kill off her abusive husband, but I love the reveal of Kala as the bad guy and Fiona Walker's dramatic turn. Goodbye. Your friends were here looking for you. No, don't look hopeful. They've gone and they won't be back. With Ian's innocence proven and the final key found hidden inside the murder weapon, the mace, the group return to Marinus and find no sign of Arbitan, as Yartek and the Vords have now taken over. And now we're in the final leg of the story, part six, and we've encountered so many villains, inventive threats, and even genre hopped, so now that the ultimate threat is just some dude with questionable headgear, it almost feels like a formality to just end the serial at this point. Arbitan is dead. Do you hear me? I, Yartek, am in control now.
And you know what? I'm not gonna lie, I'm an honest bloke. When we returned to Marinus for the last 10 minutes of the story, I'd genuinely forgotten what the keys were even for and what the hell the machine they unlock even did. I had to re-watch the first episode to write this review just so I could remember what we were even doing here. I kind of just wanted the story to be over at this point, and so does Ian, as he just hands over the keys to Yartek, who is pretending to be Arbiton with some physical deformity underneath a piece of cloth. I do love how utterly unconvincing this disguise is because Yartek just refuses to take off his Vord helmet even when wearing the sheet. Thankfully, Ian does not believe the disguise either, thank god, giving him the fake key from the Screaming Jungle, which was a pretty clever move as the key hasn't been mentioned since it was first introduced, but they never got rid of it, so this twist checks out. But because of the programming of the Conscience of Marinus, putting the fake key into the computer will destroy it, so it's a race to escape the pyramid. Yartek uses the key, the computer explodes, the end. So, the Keys of Marinus is incredibly entertaining at points, but I'd be lying if I said it comes together into something enjoyable as a whole. There's not really a lot going on under the surface of these stories. For example, the brainwashing and the conditioning of the population of Morphaton seems to be a bit similar to the conditioning happening on Marinus due to the supercomputer, but it's never brought up or addressed. We get entertaining villains like Vesa and Kala, but the narratives have to bend over backwards to give them motives or progression, which really lessens their impact as a whole despite really good performances, and while the structure of almost each episode having a different setting prevents monotony from setting in, it does leave some of the stories feeling really rushed, like the citizens of Morphaton revolt and fight back off screen, with the Doctor questioning Altos, one of Arbiton's original crew, also off screen. I think that Terry Nation and David Whittaker had to commit to the structure of the serial and massive compromises were made with how these stories were told. And while the production design and the effects work is surprisingly good and consistent throughout, there are a few more bloopers and mistakes than you'd often find in this era of the show. You can frequently see crew members in the background, microphone and camera shadows, and this moment in part 6 where I think Hartnell forgot what his cue was for this scene because he appears to check out before the dialogue has even concluded. Yartek may put that false key into the machine at any moment. If he does, it will set the machine in motion. But once it feels the full force of the power, it'll it'll break under the strain. You mean the machine will blow up? Yes, yes and coming. everything Come in on. this building with it. Then there's this moment in part one, and I genuinely cannot tell if this was a heart nor flub or just comedic writing. The line, at this point, has become so blurred. It isn't frozen, is it? No, impossible in this temperature. Besides, it's too warm. I really admire the scale and the ambition, and there's a lot of fun moments to be found in the Keys of Mariness. It's a good romp across space, which works as a strong showing for the Doctor, Ian and Barbara. Susan, on the other hand, is basically a spare part here, who's just here to scream and get upset about everything. Even in the DVD commentary, Carol Ann Ford calls her pathetic, and in this story, I really can't disagree. I think it's one of the weaker stories from Doctor Who's first year, but even then it packs so many settings, ideas and concepts in just six weeks, and for the most part, they do stick the landing. Watching a serial go from a snow-capped survival epic to a more intimate courtroom drama is a sight to behold, and I'm glad that if these ideas were going to appear in Doctor Who, that they were just these one-and-done concepts rather than being stretched out into six or seven episodes. The last time Terry Nation wrote a script where the companions had to cross a four-foot gap, it was the centre of an entire episode, but here it's one obstacle amongst numerous others that gets dealt with in a couple of scenes. But anyway, the Keys of Marinus served as the Doctor and Friends' latest epic sci-fi journey, so now it's time to go back to Earth's past. Marco Polo writer John Lucarotti is back with another script, and this time Barbara takes centre stage as she hopes to change history for the better in The Aztecs. I'll see you all next time.
Well, that sure was a wild one, wasn't it, folks? I did not realise at the beginning of this marathon that I would have an excuse to play some Ace Attorney music over William Hartnell Doctor Who footage. But thanks so much for watching this review. If you enjoyed it, be sure to hit that like button. Really, really helps me out. If you want to see more like it, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you're notified on when I do more of them. And leave a comment down below to appease the almighty YouTube algorithm. I hope you've been enjoying this marathon so far. It's given me the opportunity to watch some classic Doctor Who stories that I'd never seen before, like Marco Polo, like The Key of Marinus and many more up ahead. I'd also like to give a shout out to my patrons who help to keep the lights on here. They help to financially support me, help to allow me to do the videos that I love to create. You should be seeing their names appearing on screen now for the credits, but I'd like to give a shout out to these particular patrons. Adam Gratton, Angus Bajanison, Callum Baird, Chiba City Blues, Dan the Dreamer Shill, Daniel Davis, Darren Carver Bausiger, Dean Jones, Dr. Hadley, Dragon Bugs, Dylan Whitaker, Evil Dalek 79, Finley Rude, Flipmeister MK, Ginger Animator, Hunter Graham, Jack D. Evans, James Ivory, Jared Saylor, Joseph Adams, Leela, Mario Fanboy 15, Matthew Perry, Michael Serrano, Miranda Logan, Nate Harris, Nathaniel Holden, Palex, Raven Woods, Reese Lloyd, Ross, Ryan Duncan, Samuel Whitaker, Steve Fiore, Taylor Wooderson, the Brit Sniper, The Doctor 14 Blu-ray Reviews, Timbo 1834, Toby Loxton, Will, Zabi 55 I nearly did a full uninterrupted take then, but then Theo decided to interrupt. Zabi 555 and Strange Folk. Thanks so much to all of my patrons. If you want to get your name on that list as well, be sure to check the link in the description. You'll be massively helping to support this channel. And with that said, I'll see you all next time.